Welcome to Nitakis, my name is Mrs. Ramal. This is a special video that I prepared for the grade 12s to help them with the exam preparation. And this is a crash course on DNA, meiosis, reproductive strategies and genetics. Right, let's get down to our preparation. We start off with DNA. And this is the DNA. And we know that DNA stands for deoxyribose nucleic acid. Right, we know that DNA is found in the mitochondria or the nucleus. In a plant, it's found in the chloroplast. Now, what is the monomer or a building block of a nucleic acid or the DNA? It's a nucleotide. So in pink here, I have the phosphate group. In orange here, with the five sides, because it's a pentose sugar, the sugar, and then of course attached to the pentose sugar, the nitrogenous base. Now, when you're labeling, the pink portion will be phosphate group. This is a DNA. So you will mention this as a deoxyribose sugar. Never just say sugar. And then of course you have your nitrogenous bases. Adenine always pairs with thymine. Cytosine always pairs with guanine. The bonds that hold the nitrogenous base together, the nitrogenous bases together, is the hydrogen bond. And in brackets you write it's weak. This on the side is the DNA and sugar backbone. Make sure you know that it's the DNA, it's a phosphate and sugar backbone. Make sure you know that. Now, what are the building blocks of the DNA? It's a nucleotide, as you can see, I circled it. Now, what is the function of the DNA? The DNA controls the functions of the cell, contains the hereditary genetic information, and controls protein synthesis. Right. Let's look at the RNA. Again in pink, the phosphate group the sugar right it's five-sided so the orange part again you don't just say sugar it's the ribose sugar this is an rna so you will label it according to the sugar so rna will have ribose sugar dna deoxyribose sugar i have put here that the bond between the sugar and the phosphate group is a phosphodiester bond now rna is single-stranded and rna will not have thymine Uracil replaces thymine. What's the function of the RNA? RNA is involved in protein synthesis. Right, let's look at DNA replication. DNA replication occurs at interface. This process is controlled by enzymes and it occurs in the nucleus. So the first step, the DNA helix unwinds. As you can see, the weak hydrogen bonds are breaking. The two strands unzip. The original strand acts as a template. Okay, free DNA nucleotides from the nucleoplasm move along and reach the complementary basis, as you can see here. Then two genetically identical DNA strands are formed. The process is semi-conservative. And then the two new DNA strands wind up again to form a double helix. That is the shape of the DNA, a double helix. What's the significance of DNA replication? DNA replication doubles the genetic material that can be shared by the new cells arising from cell division. All right, let's look at protein synthesis. Let's look at some of our labels. This is a DNA. The coding strand here in the DNA is the one that's being copied or the one that acts as a template. And the non-coding strand is a strand that's not being copied to form the mRNA. This process here is called transcription in the nucleus. The triplet nitrogenous bases on the mRNA are called codons. This is the nuclear membrane, and that's the nuclear pore. There you have your codons attached to the ribosome. There you have your tRNA with the anticodon, and then the amino acids. That will have be bonded by peptide bonds to form the protein. This process is called translation. Now, in transcription, this is what you must memorize from the exam guidelines. You will always be asked this. In the exam guidelines, this is what you must memorize for translation. Make sure you know this well. Now, you will be asked the role of DNA in transcription of the protein synthesis or in protein synthesis. So, the DNA will code for a protein, particular protein or amino acid sequence. One strand of the DNA acts as a template to form the mRNA. The reason for that is because the DNA cannot leave the nucleus. What's the role of the mRNA in protein synthesis? The mRNA has the coded message for the protein synthesis. 
mRNA moves out of the nucleus to the ribosome where the code is used for making the protein. What's the role of tRNA in protein synthesis? tRNA carries an amino acid based on its anticodon. The anticodon and the tRNA will match the codon and the mRNA. Amino acids will become attached in a sequence determined by the mRNA. Peptide bonds formed between the amino acids and then the required protein is formed. What is my advice to you? Do not get confused between DNA replication and pro protein synthesis. DNA replication will only have a thymine. Protein synthesis will have a thymine and a uracil present. Right, let's look at some answers. Let's look at some questions so that we can quickly see if we know what we're talking about. Study the diagram below, which shows a section of DNA molecule in a process during a process taking place in a cell. Now, 211, name the process represented in the diagram. If you look carefully, can you see there's only thymine and thymine? So this can only be DNA replication. Okay. When will this take place? At interface. What's the label for one? If this is cytosine, right, this will obviously be guanine, right, because it's complementary. So this is cytosine, this is guanine, so this will be cytosine again. Nice questions. State two ways in which the structure of RNA differs from structure from the DNA structure. Of course, here DNA is double stranded, RNA is single stranded. DNA has thymine, RNA has uracil. Simple. Simple. All right, the diagram below shows the process of protein synthesis. What is molecule X? Look carefully. It's the DNA. The shape tells me that. Organelle Y, I know it's a ribosome. What's the nitrogenous base numbered 1? So, if this is the tRNA, opposite C will be G, so it will be guanine. And identify the nitrogenous base label 3, opposite A will be uracil. Describe the role of the DNA during transcription. You've already got that answer. And describe the part of protein synthesis shown at W, which occurs at organelle Y. Where's W? Let me see. That's translation. And again, you know exactly, you memorize transcription, translation and you can write it down. Right. Now we're moving on to meiosis. Meiosis is reduction division. Okay. And meiosis is very, very important. Now, meiosis occurs in reproductive organs, the ovary, the testes in humans, in the ovary, in the anther, in plants. Now, firstly, we start off with meiosis 1. There's meiosis 1 and meiosis 2 in my, um, meiosis. There's two divisions. So, firstly, we start off with homologous chromosomes forming. Homologous chromosomes have the same size, have the same shape, have the same syndrome position, have the same gene and the same gene locus. As you can see in this picture here, here are homologous chromosomes. And remember, one will be maternal, one will be paternal. In the center, that round structure, that's the centromere, and the long strands are the chromatids. Now, before meiosis 1 occurs, we know what takes place, interphase, and what happens at interphase, DNA replication. Then, we know prophase 1, and always say prophase 1, prophase 2, metaphase, you have the numbers. Spindle fibers form, as you can see, the nucleolus, nuclear membrane disappears. But most importantly, you can see the homologous chromosomes form. One is maternal, one is paternal. Then the chromosomes come to lie next to each other. When they lie next to each other, they're known as bivalence. Then they touch at the chiasma, and then exchanging of genetic material takes place, and this process is called crossing over, and the significance is genetic variation. Then you have, can you see here, metaphase 1. Meta means middle. So can you see the chromosomes move to the middle, but we can't call it the middle. It is called the equator. And because it's meiosis 1 here, can you see? It's the homologous chromosomes that are moving to the equator. But every time this happens in the body, there is no set arrangement of the chromosomes at the equator or no set pattern. And that brings about more genetic variation. All right. Then, can you see anaphase 1? What's happening? One of the homologous chromosomes are moving to opposite poles. 
okay and then here you can see telophase one what is happening cytokinesis is taking place and the chromosome number has been halved you start off with four chromosomes here in the beginning and now you have two chromosomes in each cell in two cells how do you know that this is a plant cell sorry how do you know that this is an animal cell forgive me sorry there's a groove a constriction and an imagination so you know that this is an animal cell right something very really important i want to just quickly revise with you grade 12s you're going to see a chromosome like this coming up and like this so when it comes to meiosis 2 we'll talk about the different types of chromosomes right but when it comes to meiosis 1 you always use the word homologous chromosomes can you see homologous chromosomes form here okay right then you had homologous chromosomes with the equator then you said one of the homologous pairs of chromosomes moved to opposite poles so can you see what words i used here homologous chromosomes okay so remember to use those words let's go to meiosis 2 meiosis 2 can you see now you have the same two cells that's going to undergo meiosis 2 the nucleolus and the nuclear membrane disappear spindle fibers form that you can see chromatin network forms the chromosomes can you see now two cells with two chromosomes crossing over has already taken place in meiosis 1 in prophase 1 then can you see here single chromosomes move at the equator so that has to be metaphase 2 the chromosomes are single but here something very important takes place at anaphase 2 can you see the centromere is splitting now and the word you will use here so it splits and then you have a chromosome that looks like that you can use the word single chromosome but now most of the time we are using the word unreplicated chromosome so you can decide what word you want to use. I would suggest you go to past papers, see what word is being used and learn that. Okay. And then you can see the four gametes form. And can you see the chromosomes are unreplicated or single? You started off with four chromosomes in the beginning and now the chromosome number has been halved. In each cell, there's two chromosomes and there are four cells. So this is what you must remember. Now, if you remember from mitosis, if you remember your work from mitosis, so let's look at this again. In mitosis, the chromosome looked like this. This is a replicated chromosome. Because you must remember, one strand of DNA forms one, goes into one chromosome. So this was an unreplicated chromosome. After DNA replication took place from one cell, from one chromosome, two chromosomes, uh, two DNA molecules formed, and that will be in each chromosome. So the chromosome actually looks like this because of DNA replication. Go back and revise your work from grade 10, as you should have learned this in grade 10. But you're only welcome to use the word unreplicated chromosome at telophase 2 and at anaphase 2 okay right so that was meiosis now in the november 2014 paper 2 there was an essay for how is meiosis responsible for genetic variation go and look for that grade 12s and write that down and make a note of it now what's the significance of mitosis it produces genetically identical cells it replaces and repairs old and damaged cells, allows for growth of an organism. What's the significance of meiosis? Reduces the chromosome number to produce haploid gametes. Genetic variation is important for natural selection. And prevents the doubling effect of fertilization and ensures chromosome number of a species remains constant. All right, let's look at some questions. Label structures A, B, and C. Now A, can you see it's pointing to a chromatid? B is pointing to the center of that chromatid, so that's the centromere. And C, as usual, centrum is pointing to the spindle fiber. Which phase is represented by diagram one? Can you see the chromosomes are in the middle? And they single, so metaphase two. Diagram two, oh, you can see the very important process crossing over. 
write down the numbers on, of the diagrams to show the correct sequence in which the phases occur. So let's look at it first. So it will first be first, two, then three, then one and two. Okay. Tabulate three differences between the first and second stages of meiosis. That's very easy. I would say in the first stage, crossing over. In the second stage, no crossing over. Right. How many cells, um, homologous chromosomes are involved in the first division? And there's no homologous chromosomes formed or single chromosomes are involved. And then two cells form in the first meiosis and then four cells form. Okay. Right. Remember, it's seven marks old. Draw a table. Name and explain two processes that ensure the gametes produced at the end of meiosis are genetically different from each other. Name and explain. First one is crossing over. We know that there is an exchange of genetic material between the maternal and paternal chromosomes, which brings about genetic variation for natural selection. And then there's random arrangement of the chromosomes at the equator, at metaphase 1 and metaphase 2. That there's, every time this takes place in your body, there's no set pattern or arrangement of the chromosomes, which brings about different combinations of genes. Okay. Another question. Provide parts, labels for parts A. It's a chromosome. B, the centromere, C, a chromatid, and the place where they're touching, chiasma. What process is illustrated in the diagram? Easy, crossing over. What's the importance of the process? Genetic variation for natural selection. Which phase of meiosis does this process mentioned in 212 take place? Prophase 1. And they wanted you to draw a label structure to show its appearance afterwards. So let's do this. Of which chromosome? Labeled A. This is the only time you're allowed to shade grade 12s. But here you'll draw with a pencil and then you'll shade in with a pencil. That's the only time you're allowed to shade in when you are asked to draw to represent crossing over. You're not allowed to use any other colors. So remember that. And they asked for us to have it labeled. So we must make sure after we're drawing so they want a label structure of A. A touches over, so then it will be look like this. So you label this as centromere. Chromatids, two marks. And it will be a label diagram, a label diagram of chromosome A after crossing over. There you go. That will be your heading. Right. Let's look at reproductive strategies. Now, external fertilization takes place in aquatic fish, uh, aquatic animals, fish and frogs. Internal takes place in terrestrial animals, birds, and mammals. So let's quickly do external fertilization first. There's a large number of amount of eggs. Produced because the eggs and sperm are destroyed by predators in water. Water is needed for the sperm to swim and to prevent the egg from dehydrating. Only a few embryos survive as there is a high mortality rate. Fertilization is unlikely to succeed as there is very little protection offered for the gametes. And as a large number of offspring will ensure at least some of them survive despite the high mortality rate. Internal fertilization, the sperm is directly inserted into the female's body. Sperm and eggs are not exposed to the environmental conditions. Gametes and embryos are not lost to predation or washed away. Fertilization is more likely to succeed as the protection of the gametes is greater. And there's fewer offspring produced because survival rate is greater. Right. Ovipri. Ovipri, egg-laying organisms, you can add in here outside the female's body. Ovovipri, egg is retained in the mother's body until ready to hatch. And remember... She gives birth to live young. Vivipri, organisms give birth to live young. Ovipri, there's no protection of the by the mother, or no protection of the mother, or by the mother. 
Yeah, ovovivipari, embryo protected by the mother, vivipari, embryo protected by the mother. Ovipari, embryo nourished by yolk. Ovovivipari, there's no placental connection and the em embryo is nourished by the egg yolk. And here, yeah, embryo is nourished by placenta. Ovipari could be internal or external fertilization. Ovovivipari is only internal fertilization and vivipari is internal fertilization. Right, let's look at pre pre precocial and nutritional development. Precocial, the birds or the organisms hatch in an advanced or independent state. They can capable of leaving the nest immediately look for food. Usually they'll be assisted by one parent. They're mobile after birth. There's not much parental care needed as they can find food and run from predators. Their nests are built on the ground so they can leave the nest and around look for food. They're found in an embryo with their fewer predators and more food is available. The eggs are usually quite big to contain more yolk for more developing for more developed hatchling there's a large amount of energy demand for females to produce these eggs but once they hatch it is less demanding on her altricial is the exact opposite birds hatch in a relatively undeveloped state they stay in a nest they're helpless and are fed by the parents for some time they're immobile for some time after birth there are lots of parental care needed after the eggs hatch. The nests are built off the ground in trees out of reach of predators. They are found in a normal environment where they are predators. The eggs are smaller with less yolk as hatchling is underdeveloped. And there's less amount of energy demanded for females to lay the eggs. But once they hatch, then it's more demanding on her. Okay, let's look at genetics now. A monohybrid cross is a cross between ind two individuals that involves one trait or one characteristic. A dihybrid cross is a cross between two individ individuals with two different traits or two different characteristics. Right. Here, yeah, this is how you set up a cross, a monohybrid cross. Right. You must have your P1. You must have your phenotype, your genotype, your meiosis, your gametes, your word fertilization. And then you can have your Punnett square. I would prefer you to use a Punnett square. And then you can have your phenotype and genotype of the offspring. All right, incomplete dominance is an example. When you take a red flower and a white colored flower, you get pink flowers. You get a new phenotype that forms because neither allele is dominant over each other. You get an intermediate phenotype. Or red flower, blue flower, purple. Co-dominance, you get a red and white flower. White and there uh, you can see in my picture white and red flowers, and then you get red and white. So both alleles are equally expressed in the phenotype. Or the example, yellow and blue, you get a blue and yellow flower. Multiple alleles, when there's more than two alleles that determine the inheritance of a characteristic, and that is with blood groups. And you write your blood groups are how it is written here. Now, recently in the matric exam, there's been a change in the exam. They want you to write your I like that. And you must write your small I like that as well. Okay. Do not write it like that or like that as you see in my work. So you can just fix that up as well. Do we, don't even have to put the dots as well. So, yeah, this is a sex-linked um, disease. Sex-linked here, the diseases are X-linked. It's carried on the X chromosomes. That's why females can be heterozygous. Males will definitely have the condition as they have only one X chromosome. These conditions are X-linked. Okay. So can you see the relationship between gender and hemophilia? See, hemophilia is a sex-linked disease. Can you see in the key more men are affected because they have only one X chromosome? They're either going to get the condition or not. Right. So what's the phenotype of Peter? Let's look at Peter. Where's Peter. Peter is a male hemophiliac, so he will be obviously. All right, that's Peter. Enid is the mother, but can she see? She has a hemophiliac son, so she must be heterozygous. All right, you can say in brackets she has normal, but she's carrying the hemophiliac gene. In brackets, you can say she's a carrier. And Clarence is a normal male so this is the normal male okay that's quite easy 
Here I've included my rules for genetics. Right. So, dominant gene is represented by a capital letter, recessive by a small letter. When you have a homozygous recessive, homozygous dominant, all the offspring are will be the heterozygous dominant. Heterozygous dominant, heterozygous dominant, you will always have a ratio of 3 to 1. Heterozygous dominant and homozygous recessive, your ratio will always be 2 is to 2, 50 50. That's if you're using this key. Incomplete dominance, when you take a white flower and a red flower, all the offspring obviously pink. The two pink flowers crossed, you'll have a ratio of 1 is to 2 is to 1, 1 white flower, 2 pink flower, 1 red flower. When it comes to blood groups, I've rewritten it. So the one here in the notes is not written very accurate according to the new notes, so I will just quickly remove it. So on the side, let's look at the one blood group that you use that will get you all the blood types. I, A, small i, I, B, small i. That's how you write your, geno your gametes. And then you have one person with blood type AB, one person with I, O, with AO, sorry, then BO, and then OO, blood types. So this is the cross that will give you all the blood types. Usually comes out in multiple choice. Dihybrid crosses, if you're using these characteristics here, route seed, wrinkle seed, yellow flower, green flower. When you have a homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive, all the offspring, will, there'll be 16 of them that will be heterozygous for round and yellow for round seed and yellow flower. Then heterozygous and heterozygous dominant, the ratio will be 9331. Heterozygous dominant and homozygous recessive, that's where you'll have your ratio of 4444 or 1111. And then here, if you have big R, small R, small Y, Y, and big R, big R, and small Y, and small Y, you get a ratio of 8 is to 8 or 1, 1. Okay, so these are just some of my rules that I decided to share with you. It was just a crash course to help you before your exams to prepare. And the notes are quite good. So thank you for joining me. Join me and watch all my other videos as well.